Camilo, thank you very much for the generous introduction. Can you hear me well? Yes? So, Camilo, a brief introduction uh, of myself, so I'm not going to repeat that. And I'm going to go just right away to design and artificial intelligence. And um, let me uh, start with saying that the, the lecture is based on my book, New architecture design artificial intelligence web subsets um, and free on the use of artificial intelligence in architecture design uh, I've been doing research on AI and architecture uh, starting in 1997 uh, but this was already part of the AI winter so to speak so it actually started to really get interesting around 2017, 2018, when new methods came about that we were actually able to use uh, with our design ideas. But let me start with a very general use, generally speaking. There's a kind of a short answer to that, which is it's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to fix. So what do I mean by that? You've probably seen um, about how cars were assembled until um, the late 60s or 70s. So here's a video from 1973 from the Volkswagen Beetle assembly line. And then another one from Ford in Dearborn in 1962. And um, the idea behind that is to show that to do this, there was it was necessary to have a certain expertise. So this is an expert system. These are people who did nothing else but that. This started to change in the 70s with the introduction of the first industrial robot on an assembly line, which was the Unimate, using the General Motors in a factory in New Jersey. So starting on that point, we started to see videos like this here, right? Where you see uh, how cars are being assembled. But more importantly than the technology it used or the price it got, are a lot of fundamental questions that, are, that uh, arise around this piece of art, like for example, about agency, the authorship, the sensibility. Um, so uh, these are really interesting. Also, who is the author who came up with a gun? Is it the programmer who programmed the generative adversary network? Or is it the hundreds of maybe thousands of names of the artists in the data set that was used to make this, this image? And the rise of neural art became very visible around 2018 when we saw also work from uh, artists like uh, Sofia Crespo and others. Um, of course, also uh, um, uh, um, Mario Klingemann, for example, comes to mind. And we had around the same time also our experiments in creating data sets, for example, in this case of Gothic architecture, and then uh, running them through a style gun and trying to figure out what we see in the latent space of this imagery. Um, the main question that arose for us was, what is the role X role in a context where the soul out is more, but when C is shared? We started also to do a variety of experiments with plants already in 2017, 2018. Uh, trying to figure out can we use data sets of sections and plans to ge automatically generate plans. Uh, this was very exciting and interesting um, and it also really provided us with a lot of insights in what we can do actually with this data. But most interesting for, for us was maybe the, the sort of aesthetical qualities of these results that absolutely can be described with estranged or defamiliarized. So what is meant by estrangement or defamiliarization. Uh, it's an alluring area of consideration regarding the discussion of architecture design with the aid of neural networks. The term itself was coined in 1917 by the Russian formalist Viktor Shlovsky in his famous article Art as Technique and describes an artistic method that provokes the audience with imagery depicting everyday things in unfamiliar or strange ways. The goal was to provide the audience with the opportunity to gain new perspectives and observe the world through a different lens, through techniques that introduce abstraction into the aesthetics of realism. The concept has influenced 20th century art and theory, including Dada, postmodernism, epic theater, science fiction, and philosophy. 
it's not a new concept. Uh, Hegel already talked about this, Karl Marx talked about uh, estrangement, uh, Viktor Slavsky I mentioned already, and the theater director Bertolt Brecht actually used it regularly in his place. And absolutely also right, because they talked about estrangement and familiarization, and he actually wrote an essay in 1980 called Das Unheimliche, The Uncanny, where Freud defines the uncanny as deeply rooted in what is known to individuals as common or familiar, but deviations from the familiar defamiliarization aspects of life result in emotional response akin to fear or curiosity. This is an example that I'd like to show to demonstrate that in an architectural context. So every trained architect will recognize in this AI-generated image certain architectural features uh, that will also be recognized as a specific style, I would say, like modern. And so there's like this rectangular shapes, cantilevering, la la long uh, window frames, uh, um, panoramic views to the outside, and so on and so forth. So all of those are elements to recognize as familiar to us as architects. But then there are things going on here which are really strange like the connection to the ground, like what's happening there. Is, this, is the building growing out of the ground? Was it cut from the ground? Same with the, with the roof line. Is the roof line damaged? Is it broken? Was it intentionally done like that? So it, it creates a tension, and that's very, an important point about it. In my opinion, designing with um, AI and artificial intelligence is the first generally uh, 21st century design method. If you think about it, uh, all the design methods, computational design methods to be specific, that we have been applying in the last 23 years have been derivates of things that already were invented in the 20th century and applied already in the 20th century as design methods in architecture, such as parametric modeling, agent-based modeling, scripting, versioning, modeling. Uh, Not all things were done already in the 20th century and applied. Uh, but what we see now is something really completely different. Neural architecture is a new paradigm, not only intellectually and culturally, but also technically. What we see today was not yet possible even a decade ago. Now let me talk about the elephant in the room, text-to-image generators. So if even John Oliver talks about them, it's clear that they have reached the core of mainstream in a very short time, just a couple of months actually. Uh, I'll would like to show this um, quote by Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, when it is about image generation based on text, that the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. We had an early experiment in 2020 using something called an attentional generative adversarial network uh, to create um, an architecture project. And what we did was we used prompts that gave us images. Yeah? And the prompts were a combination of the program that we wanted to use in the building and some um, surreal element that we added to it to make it a little bit more interesting. So we created the images and out of the, out of the colorful results we got, we basically extracted volumes that allowed us to create the entire design, uh, which is a, which a, it was a high school competition for a high school for around 3,000 uh, students. So this was a proof concept for us text to generate images um, for a design. Very early last year around found out about disco diffusion, the diffusion model that I used and I immediately went ahead and created this sort of endless plan generator. So it was a lot of fun. So this was the first um, try that I had with some of the new diffusion models that can generate images from text. One of the questions why we as architects feel so attracted to diffusion models like Midjourney, DALI2, Stable Diffusion or Disco Diffusion as I showed before is because I think they amplify a notion that we have as architects anyways, which is to work, work variations. Uh, so you see here an example um, of 28 model variations for a high-rise building that was designed in the Atelier Hans Holland in 2004. This is to show you the sort of working through variations as part of architectural tradition and that gets really amplified with mid-journey. I did a little math last year and I discovered that uh, from um, April, I think April till August last year, I generated 71,000 images in mid-journey. And I'm not even a power user, there's people that even do more than that. 
So it shows you that uh, you can explosively work with variation in this tool. How do they work? I'm going to go very quickly through this. Um, so it's really interesting that around 2010, because we had enough annotated images, we could create something that was called um, an automated image captioning model, which basically you, you show it an image and it will describe what it is, right? So it can say something like, this, it sees an image and then says, the caption of this is people walking on a bridge. Now somebody came up with the idea, what happens if, if we turn it around? What if we say people walking on a bridge and we let uh, a model uh, generate an image? And, and that person was Elman Mansinov and his colleagues at Amazon Web Services. Um, they also created immediately a paper called Generating Imaging. Uh, which was published in 2016 and that was like the first attempt to create image just based on text a sign is flying in the blue skies a herd of elephants flying in the blue skies a toilet seat sits open in a grass field vast desert so those are a very very uh, suggestive not very focused not very sharp uh, it's also because they were all probably resolution of 72 by 72 pixels, which is sort of a standard uh, for using in computer uh, uh, science when you're doing tests. However, what diffusion models, models do is quite amazing. They take an image, they add noise to it until it becomes a completely random image, and then basically reverse the process and reconstruct an image uh, by um, uh, denoising, basically until it creates an image based on your prompt. This was like a very simple and short explanation. I could do like a whole one, two hour lecture on explaining how diffusion models work. It's quite fascinating. So let's see what it can do. Uh, so let's print, let's do a prompt like me from the Royal Building. And of course it does things like this, which I think is quite, quite boring to do in this fantastic model, but we will do it. Um, and then also there's like the differences between between the different models, um, a section drawing through an opera house, for example, from Mid-Journey version 2, it looked like this. A lot of noise, a lot of errors, a lot of hallucinations happening here, which for me personally is the interesting part. And then the newer version, version 4, section drawing through an opera house, same prompt. And these results are less imaginative, Yes, sure, they have more detail, they have more things going on, but they're also sort of like the cliché representation of what an opera should look like. So to do something innovative or different, it might not be that useful. Let's do something different. Let's use the prompt, the most beautiful house in the world. That's what it imagines in version 2. That would be the most beautiful house in the world. Okay. Let's try with version 4, the most beautiful house in the world. Okay, so if this is what an AI think, it's the most beautiful house in the world. Yeah, I don't think we're ha we have our jobs. I don't think our jobs are in danger as architects for the foreseeable future. I started to do a variety of different uh, experiments um, where I, you remember that when we did high school, we also combined programmatic simple language with something surreal, and that's exactly what we did here too. So, for example, creating a house made of feathers, or they could be see a house made of Kobe beef, or a hairy villa. But from version to version, they're getting better and better. So this is agent four. Uh, sections and and the model and they don't correlate with each other of course but it's quite fascinating that it's getting so good at it now for more or less a practical application because all of these are images now now how do we do 3d models out of that and in order to demonstrate that i would like to show you a project called the generally center which is uh, a project here at one of the main shopping streets in vienna and uh, the general center there uh, it sits on a corner and we designed up uh, it's basically like a combination between office space apartments and shopping it's a shopping mall down there and we wanted to create something that somehow uh, 
place in the tradition of brutalist building. So we trained a neural network uh, on several thousand images from uh, brutalist buildings, and then we got results out of that. And then we created a latent walk. The latent walk is a very interesting thing. It allows you to see ex uh, data points that are present between existing data points. Meaning if you have two images of um, brutalist buildings, it will show you what is between these two. And it's not just a blending tool. It's really something different because it learns the features and creates new images, new images based on those features. Now from that Latin work, we selected a couple of uh, images um, that allowed us to create a, a three-dimensional model out. You have to think of it as either sections or elevations that you can generate and then use those to create a model or a plan. You can do also plans and elevations. All of these combinations are possible. And that was the basis for the continued work on the, on the project. Um, and the results basically is building this very strange, rugged, brutalist nightmare, which I love. I think it's amazing um, that uh, we had to add, of course, things to this to make it work as a project. So we had floor plates and elevators and staircases, like all these sort of functional things we had to manually add to this project. So a, a perfectly, completely uh, working 3D model generator for a 3D model generator based on neural networks or AI. I don't think there's a really successful out there at the moment, but we're getting closer. So all the things that are out here in this image are basically the things that we had to add to the project. The next one is, is a commission for a house in, in, in Austria, in the Alps. Um, this was an interesting commission. Um, uh, a, neuro, a, neuro, a neurologist actually heard about um, our design methods. And of, as you know, uh, AI or neural networks are all based on neuroscience or neuroscience insights. So he liked the idea that we are using something that is so close to his field to create architecture. So he commissioned us to create for him sort of like a weekend vacation home in the Alps that he can use in winter for skiing or he can use in summer for when, it, when Vienna gets too hot, they go out there. Similar to the project before, we created this latent walk between um, mid-century modern uh, houses. This was one of his uh, conditions. He wanted it to be a mid-century modern house. So we thought, like, okay, let's take a, let's make a data set of mid-century modern houses and then apply that. Similarly to the project before, also like creating a pixel project to create the model. But what is quite incredible is that this time the, the result was really successful in terms of creating a complete interior, a complete exterior, and, and giving us the opportunities to interpret results as uh, pragmatic, programmatic elements of the house, meaning the kitchen, the living room, the sleeping rooms, etc., etc., were generated ad hoc by this fixed projection approach. So this was the last project I wanted to show. Maybe just quickly, uh, I'm also the founder of the Neural Architecture Group, which is a group of architects uh, interested in AI. The funny thing is that we founded this group in 2020, and it was a very small group. Uh, of course, the number of architects interested in AI exploded specifically in the last year and this year. So uh, we will probably have to add more people to this neural architecture group. Then there is the AIarchitects.org website, which collects um, several different positions about um, uh, architecture and artificial intelligence. So you can see a variety of different people working with it on that website. And as mentioned already at the beginning, uh, the, the Architecture and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, which, we, uh, which was founded by Sandra Manninger, myself, and also with the help of Alexandra Carlson um, uh, at Taubman College, which focuses on research ex explicitly uh, in architecture design methodologies that you can use. And it's a, it's a collaborative effort. So it's a interdisciplinary laboratory between architecture, computer science, robotics, and data science. And if, you, if this lecture was too short for you or you want to hear more detail, please visit my YouTube channel. Um, there are several lectures on there which go into more detail than I could do in, in about half an hour. Um, I think that, that 
uh, will provide you with a, a more in-depth inter like presentation of the things that I've been discussing here. This is the book, Neural Architecture, Design and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, it's available, uh, I'm not going to say names now, but everywhere where you can buy books. And then also I would like to show you the Machine Hallucinations AD, uh, uh, Machine Hallucinations, Architecture and Artificial Intelligence, which I guest edited together with Neil Leach uh, also last year. And, and I'm happy also to announce that AD commissioned me with another uh, issue of uh, AD about uh, AI and architecture, which is the next year. And this is coming out in spring this year. It's a book called Diffusions, Taxonomy of Synthetic Imaginations, published by Wiley, uh, which will talk only about uh, diffusion diffusion models like Midjourney, DALI, uh, Stable Diffusion and so on. There is about 20 architects in the book and four theorists all discussing this problem. It's a very exciting thing. Uh, um, I think it's turning out good. I, I knock on wood, yeah, but I think it's okay. I hope it's going to be interesting for you. So thank, thank you very much and I'm very, very much looking forward for your Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, we can't, uh, I can ask a question. Sure. Uh, first, uh, I want to say that thank you very much. Uh, I saved screenshot image from your uh, slides. I liked uh, examples. Uh, I can try. Uh, example i i can prepare example ai from your site uh what do you mean by that uh, for example uh, we can prepare example ai image i looked your slide i can try uh, i can prepare my own example ai from your uh, application i understand that you have Example applications uh, to your site? Well, I mean, first I have to say that uh, things like Midjourney or DALI, like image generators, they're not mine. It's not my application. Uh, these are from other companies. I just use it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, for example, when I use like the last, the building examples that I showed, the data sets that are made for those uh, building designs, these were specifically done by me, yes. I can I can also share those data sets if anyone is interested. Uh, I think they're actually already available on our, uh, on the website of Ariel. Uh, let me put the website on the, in the chat. Uh, yeah, somehow the chat is not loading in my, on my site. That's, mm -hmm. Let's see. Yes,
So the, this is an ongoing debate uh, where we need still to learn a lot. But uh, one of the problems we have, of course, is, as you mentioned, Camilo, correctly, bias data sets. So that they're like specifically only um, addressing one specific culture or, or one specific race. And so racial bias and cultural bias is very common in the sets, uh, primarily because it depends on how you build them. Uh, what we're trying to do in the IRI laboratory is to create data sets that hopefully include as many different diverse voices as possible in order to uh, create a data set that, that complies with uh, diversity, equality and, inclus and inclusive uh, ideas. Right? So, for example, when we do, we are currently doing a data set of apartment plans and uh, in order to create a, a data set that is as diverse as possible, we address people all around the world, helping us to collect the, the uh, plans, but also to annotate them. And the more, more people are involved, the, the, the less or, or the smaller the chances of really heavy bias are uh, present. However, I have to say that although we tried that and really tried to address as many people as possible, I recently looked into the statistics of exactly that data set and saw that we still have almost 70% Western contributors. So they are from Europe or the United States. Uh, I was expecting more contributors from Asia or from Africa, but we, we're not getting them. So what we need to do in order to create maybe more just data sets is we need to find the people and convince them to be part of it. Because if we don't do this, the data sets will always be, always be biased and we cannot escape that sort of dominance of Western architectural design. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, so um, there's a couple of, um, of difficulties with that, but it's, generally speaking, it's possible. So, for example, right now we are working on an installation that is going to open up on May 9th in the MAC in Vienna, where we use MidJourney, an image generator, basically, to do images and then transform those images into models. However, the methods are still being developed. So we are very early on that. And honestly, to, to do it right would mean to create a data set of 3D models where a neural network has the possibility to learn features and then create new models. So this is possible, but it's a lot of work. So for example, we also, also in the ARI laboratory, we're working on a 3D model data set for one family housing projects. And right now we have about 10,000 models in that data set. That is a small data set, still. Yeah? The more data you have, the higher the chances are that your AI will optimize correctly or will predict correctly. Um, either way, it's, what I can say to that question is, yes, those things are possible and people are working on them, but we need to work together as an, architect, as an architecture community contributing to those data sets in order to increase the size to the point where it really can produce robust results yeah so the, 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 I want to say something more, one more thing about that um, the the idea in the architecture discipline about this one genius architect who sits down and makes a sketch on a napkin and that becomes an ingenious building we have to go away from that model the star architect is dead yeah forget it it's done over what we need to do now is work as a community work as a, as, as a group of people, as architects all over the world, 
to improve how we can use AI and architecture to make architecture better, better for everybody, not just for people with money. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Tampo. I, I have a question. If you can hear me, okay? Sure, I can hear you. So I was very excited to uh, attend your lecture. I'm a clinical neurologist based out of Florida myself, and so when I saw neural architecture, I used, it caught my attention. So I had to come. And I really enjoyed your lecture. Um, something that I really admired was that this bit about um, uh, the these automotive the the robots that you know build cars and how rather than knowing how, how to weld in a you know a three-dimensional coordinates but instead are learning the concept of welding and what it means to weld to build a vehicle i really that really caught my attention because it sounds like that would open up these you know the ability of these robots to understand you know a kind of a foundation of understanding to where they maybe off of that in the future could start um, coming up with their own novel or original designs or builds. Is there is there any evidence out there to suggest now that AI, when it comes to design, instead of just kind of constructing things that are or that are an amalgam of what's already out there, is there any evidence to suggest that AI can start designing or making their own new novel design, something that might even be completely foreign to us as humans? That is a great question. That is a great question. Uh, I mean, first of all, I might have, I might have exaggerated when I say that AIs understand something. I'm not entirely sure if they understand anything, but the one thing they can certainly do is learn, learn, learn things. Um, they're really good learning systems. So at the moment, what neural networks or AI does, it's, it's all based, of course, on, on existing knowledge, right? On existing, for example, three-dimensional three coordinates of a welding robot. This is existing data, right? That is out there. And it can interpolate between those existing data points to come up with solutions for a problem. In this case, the problem is, where should I weld that car? And because it has so many million points it learned from, it learns the it learns the, the, the most probable points to put the weld on. So these are all very good machines that optimize towards uh, probability. Yeah. Uh, but your question, I think, is amazing because I think people are at least computer scientists um, are hoping to get to that point where a machine can. Uh, uh, based on the knowledge that it has been exploring uh, or looking into, come up with a solution that we do not expect. Those things are already happening, by the way. Yeah, um, I mean, people are maybe a little hesitant to call it um, understanding or consciousness uh, or lucidity or anything like that. But um, if you think, for example, uh, about, I don't know if you have ever heard about AlphaGo, no, AlphaGo no. Was, yeah, that's pretty interesting because that's basically a, a neural network or a machine that was um, that was trained to play Go. And, and oh, and Go, I have heard about this. Yes, yes, yes. And the interesting point about it is that Go has, first of all, an immense amount of possible moves, and second, it needs something like intuition to be a good player in Go. And regardless, this machine was able to beat the nine-time world champion in Go. And it did this using, among other things, a move that no one would have been expected. So it did something that a lot of people started to consider as being creative. It was a creative move. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of debates in architecture, in the arts, in, in other fields about what it means if a machine can be creative. I personally, I'm not entirely sure whether the machine was creative or just really high trained uh, um, either way what you're asking I think we're getting there I think we're slowly approaching the point where she can come up with a solution that is surprisingly different to us but extremely useful to us too and so this point we're really close to that point I, I totally agree with you 
you know, I've been reading of a couple instances in where um, certain laboratories that design uh, <clears throat> biologic medications or antibody based medications for certain diseases um, will utilize AI tools to kind of come up with a novel drug or a drug with a novel mechanism of action. And then they're praising it as creative. When and in reality, I think it's just, it has such a high computing capacity that it is coming up with or is discovering solutions that, you know, I guess would soon to just be discovered if you crunched enough data, basically. Right. And also, one thing I discovered, which is really funny, is that in this kind of uh, debates about creativity is that I think in most cases what happens is that we project our own creativity on the results the machine is giving us. So it's it's us saying that, wow, this is amazing, I can use that. That doesn't mean that the machine is creative. It actually means that I interpreted that result creatively. That's a very good point. <laughs> Thank you it's again. Funny. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you're, you're like the second neurologist who got interested in my work, which is really funny. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't help it. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you again, Dr. Campo. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. How do I clap on here? <laughs> <laughs>